portraits on it instead of one, one inverted to the other. These 12 tw uh, d uh, multiplied or increased by a second 12 became 24. These 24 faces, therefore, fitted very well into the concept of the 24 hours of the day, which in turn descended to us from the 24 elders before the throne in the book of Revelation. Having thus uh, more or less identified this particular point, we go on to the consideration of the cards themselves. Each of the suits consists of 13 cards, and the four suits combined give us 52, which is the number of the weeks in the year. If we add the spots on all the cards together, counting the jack as 11, the queen as 12, and the king as 13, and I'm going up from 1 to 13, the result is 364, which is one day short of the year. In order to take care of this little detail, at quite an old date, the joker was introduced, which made the number of actual spots 365. Some modern card uh, manufacturers, no doubt without any intention of so doing, now provide their decks with two jokers, whereby we take care of leap year. <laughs> but uh, uh, Milton Pottinger, in one of his studies on symbolism, points out the parallels, for example, between the symbolisms on cards and the symbols of Freemasonry and other ancient esoteric societies. This has, however, certain disadvantages, because if we trace the cards down through the centuries, we find that the many irregularities have stepped in or crept in uh, to change the appearances of the cards. It still remains true, however, that the King of Clubs is probably the Grand Master of the Secret Empire of the Cards, for he is the only one who, call, who carries the orb, which was the symbol of ultimate royalty. But all the cards can be taken and you can sit down and compare them. You can also, if you're interested, secure different cards from different makers and compare the details of symbolism. Find that in most instances, the major elements of the design are the same. There are differences, some of which may be quite significant. In the older decks, for instance, the orb of the King of Clubs is surmounted by a cross. In the modern decks, the cross has been transformed into a trifolet leaf, which no longer resembles a cross. But if you go back far enough, the cross is restored. So all the new decks and so on are hampered uh, by modernization and by the gradual conventionalizing of the symbols which are upon them. Now as we go a little further into this rather intriguing subject, we come directly to what seems to be uh, the most important of all considerations, namely the prophetic uh, use of cards. Cards as instruments of divination. And uh, to analyze this could almost confuse the world's greatest thinkers for the simple reason that it has been impossible up to the present time to explain why and how a turn of a shuffled deck of cards can produce a card with a specific meaning for an individual. Yet it would appear that such actually occurs. And if uh, various uh, persons who have been uh, in contact with cartomancy will testify that the cards do have an unca uncanny way of working out that there is something that happens in connection with the use of them uh, that seems to be still oracular, although they are now used principally in gaming. Of course, even in gaming, the players have to almost pray that the certain cards will appear. <laughs> and if they do not appear, uh, it is almost a sign 
that the judgment of heaven is against them. <laughs> of course, the judgment of heaven is sometimes modified by mock decks and other dishonest practices. Speaking about curiosities in connection with gaming, uh, King James I of England was quite an inveterate gambler. He used to love to go down to Gray's Inn and play with the attorneys down there, his favorite card games. It is even said that many titled ladies enjoyed this for avocational interest. But the king himself was apparently a very busy man, heavily burdened with the responsibilities of state. And when he played cards, he sat and one of his servants sat beside him and played the cards. The king only told him which ones to play. It was too much of a burden to pick the cards out himself. Uh, which uh, also might mean that amateur card players would perhaps be wise to have someone beside them who knows how to play for them. And maybe that was part of the king's idea. We do not know. But we do know that one year he lost a hundred pounds uh, in playing, but next year he gained back fifteen pounds of it. This is recorded as historical. <laughs> Uh, back to the problem of the moment. The use of the card seems to call to our attention some type of meditational discipline. In other words, uh, the cards form a kind of mandala. It has to be of this type of thing because various persons uh, having uh, their fortunes told by cards have different problems, innumerable. And therefore, each cause has to have more than one meaning. It has to be a grand over symbol of something in order that the readings could have some type of significance. I think it is the true of this as it is in most systems that these cards constitute a point of concentration for the person playing or delineating from the deck. This would be true in comparison to many other types of art, the primary purpose of which is to focus attention, to bring the mind to a point, to eliminate outside considerations, to absorb the person in a particular purpose. This might well be true of the gypsies and of other psychics who use cards. The cards are really not the source of the prediction. They are the uh, concentration point by which the card reader makes his own interpretation. If, for example, images can appear in a crystal ball and those involved in this belief feel that such happens and claim that it happens, then a kind of mental imagery can be stimulated by the various cards, each of the cards having a more or less general meaning, is adapted to the life of the person and then the individual who is interpreting the cards has to pick it up from there and carry it to a completion. Another interesting possibility arising in card uh, reading lies in the interlock interlocking of the magnetic field of the player or the diviner and the subject. The uh, individual may attain a certain contact telepathically. The uh, medium being a sensitive person and the card uh, delineator is a psychic without question, the concentration and uh, the proximity can result in a mingling of mental energies or psychic energies. The individual who is being read may have within himself a fairly clear picture of his dilemma, of his situation, or of his need. This can be transferred to the medium, and the medium therefore gains an instinctive, intuitive, general concept of the person for whom he is reading. 
This, in turn, makes it possible for him to draw upon the subconscious information belonging to the person who asks the question. Take, for example, a simple case. An individual loses a precious object. He goes to a gypsy who reads the cards and tells him where it is. He goes there and finds it. Now, this looks like a nice, tight little miracle and would certainly gain distinction for the delineator. But it is also true that it is quite possible that the individual who has lost the article has forgotten where he put it. But in his subconscious, the record of where he put it is still present and could be by uh, hypnotic uh, thought uh, revived. If he put it anywhere, his subconscious nature, his unconscious self, knows where the article is, although consciously he does not. In another case, the individual's unconscious knows what he should do, but is unable to transmit this to his outer personality. The inner person may also know the danger that lies ahead but it is not brought into consciousness. A psychic using a meditational device to concentrate energy may very well pick up that which is in, locked in the unconscious of the subject, but which is nevertheless actually there. Now in th matters relating to larger circumstances than this, we have to realize that everything that exists, even minerals and plants, do have a degree of, of the unconscious available to them. With the case of mankind, it is much stronger. But we must realize that a planet has an unconscious and that it is perfectly possible under certain conditions uh, for a psychic to pick up the records of the processes taking place in the structure and motion of the planetary body. In other words, there is a reason behind everything. Everything is ensouled by life. And everything that is ensouled by life can be read by a person who has this psychic or mediumistic propensity. Now, it does not follow, however, unfortunately, that psychic propensity is stable. It is something over which the possessor has very little actual control. It is not inevitable that the person, the medium, in a state of meditation or light trance, working with cards, is always going to get the right message. It is quite possible that the message depends to, to a large degree upon the orientation of the psychic. If the psychic's own nature is disturbed, or there are conflicts of interest, or there are situations that cannot be reconciled within the psychic, then the readings may not be correct. And there seems to be no way of telling just how this happens. Also, it may result from the fact that the person consulting has no clear subconscious image of his own intents or has not formulated a, pro a program or has not clearly become aware of a situation. Under such conditions, the message may not be uh, correct. By means of symbols, and there are countless kinds of them, a discipline of one-pointedness is certainly brought into focus. It is a discipline in which the person centers his entire attention upon a single point of purpose. Very few of us do this in a normal waking state. We are diversified, we are mixed up in our allegiances and in our acceptances and rejections of circumstances. But in sleep, 
uh, in dream. The possibility of archetypal dreams is enormous. The individual does contact a deeper surface of his own life, which knows more than he knows about the conditions that affect him. One of the reasons why these dream patterns come through is because he is no longer consciously using the mind to advance some attitude or belief of his own, which may be contrary uh, to the general purpose of his life. So as a dream state makes each individual receptive to a deeper part of his own nature, so the meditation state is a state of wakeful dreaming. It is a type of quietude achieved by discipline rather than by natural need for rest. We are all, every moment of the day, in need of some type of psychic rest. We wake up and we are immediately burdened with the problems of the day. And from that time on, we have very little integration in ourselves. Whatever concentration we do have is direct, directed toward our responsibilities, obligations, duties, or pleasures. Therefore, throughout our waking hours, the internal has very little opportunity to express itself. It is quite the same in the meditative disciplines of the East. You can lay out a deck of cards so that it will be very close to one of the Buddhist or Hindu mandalas. It becomes a thought picture, a kind of orderly structure, the arrangements and rearrangements of which are archetypal. It has something in common with I Ching, the classic of changes in China because these readings seemingly obtained by chance, by something like the falling of coins or the dropping of whole and broken wooden bars, these things seem completely fortuitous. The I Ching, by the way, came into the West under the name of geomancy, which uses exactly the same principles. But uh, usually, the readings are appropriate because the individual having a certain project within himself interprets into the reading the field of his interest and uh, can almost swear that the original reading was intended for him alone simply because he personalizes it. He makes it his own. He gives it a centeredness uh, that... Uh, provides what he regards as authentic information. Now, in the use of cards also, we have a great many philosophical concepts. The possibility, for example, of a rule or law governing what we call chance. In the ancient times, there was strong division of opinions concerning the fate or fortune of life. Most of the philosophical people of all times have believed that life is under law. And only those who have more or less uh, discarded both religion and philosophy are willing to accept that they are the victims of chance or circumstances. This providence that shapes our ends is therefore something that is predestined and foreordained. It is something that must happen. But how does this must happen tie into the idea of the fall of a card out of a deck in which there are other cards, the deck has been shuffled and cut. How are we to say that the one significant and appropriate card comes out of the deck? Some would say that it is the will of God, which covers a multitude of uncertainties. Others will believe uh, that there is some kind of a machinery uh, behind the individual which causes these predestined occurrences to arise in various ways. 
there's hardly anyone who lives a life in which they have not at some time received a warning or an omen or a hunch or an intuition that came true. Now, this means apparently two things. One, that the individual is in some way related to life in a manner that such curious coincidences are explainable in terms of natural law. We do not know just how to explain them, but that they must be explainable. The second thing that you find in divination is that there are indications, quite obvious and evident, that these uh, cards predict events that have not yet occurred. In other words, they will tell the outcome of a circumstance that is still uh, uncertain. We know that as individuals, we do not have full control over uh, the circumstances that we approach each day. There are possibilities, there are certainties, there are impossibilities, and we must be faced with all of them. Therefore, if there is a power somewhere to anticipate future events, even over a period of centuries, to describe in detail occurrences that have not happened, this presents a very elusive but intriguing, intriguing subject. One answer to this has been that there is no change in the life of the person or of the world, which is an immediate change. Change occurs not in the body, but in the psychic content. In other words, an earthquake does not suddenly occur merely uh, through a, a superficial accident. It is not something that just happens. An earthquake is an effect, the cause of which must be equal to the effect which it produces. This is one of the basic hermetic axioms. Now the cause of an earthquake may be moving into its final relationships long before the incident occurs. But if the cause of the earthquake exists subjectively, there may be and is evidence that this subjective cause is sometimes intuitively recognized by a person. That someone tunes in to a process before the process terminates. This seems to be, uh, to a degree, uh, true in the case of card reading. That the individual who is doing the reading is reading for a person in whom the incidents of life are forever in the forming, but do not reach a final state until they express themselves as action. It is quite possible that the psychic field is building up towards something, and that the diviner is able to tune in to this. Very often they may not do tune in in detail, but they receive the general impression of the occurrence which is being built up. A doctor can do the same thing on the physical level. The doctor can tell a patient very largely the state of his symptoms and what they will lead to if they are not corrected. Uh, Ptolemy said there was no fatal necessity in the stars, and there probably is no fatal necessity in a deck of cards. But as the doctor, because of acquaintance with the development of, a, of an ailment, can give warning, uh, can perhaps apply remedy, and can certainly diagnose the situation and arrive at a general prognosis of it. So there is within man a power uh, to know the true condition of self, something that is not within the general reach. Some believe that this knowledge of the true condition 
reposes in the soul, and that therefore the soul is the key to all prediction, all prophecy, all omens, that the psychic self within man is not only the controller of all processes taking place within him, but is also a perpetual diagnostician. It is present in him and is capable of warning. It is capable of pointing out internally through intuition, through hunches, the development and ultimate of a course of action. It also could very well tell him in character analysis the profession he is best fitted for. For the psychic center, the soul, is the manager of both the mind and the emotions. But when the mind and the emotions become too active, too highly specialized, this other, smaller, quieter voice is not heard, and if it is heard, it is rejected or ignored. So the seat of all forewarning probably rests in the individual soul, in the world soul, and in the divine soul. In these levels and in these areas, the life of the individual is no longer an uncertainty. Now, in India, it is held also that persons coming into birth have a certain power of choice as to the phases of their lives and natures which they will develop in a certain embodiment. The Indian astrologers have done a great deal of work in relating to this subject, but for the most part, their findings have been difficult to transfer into Western life. But uh, the principle is that when we come here, we unconsciously know why. We know just about what is happening. And because without the interference of the material mind and the emotions and the inhibitions of the body, the individual is able to listen more directly to the needs of the soul. He may choose a difficult life. He may choose to end a life in tragedy because he knows that in the great pattern of things, this is necessary for his own growth. The doctor may therefore warn his patient that he'd better have surgery if he wishes to recover, and if he waits too long, he won't recover. And the soul inside of man can say, you need this discipline. You'd better have it as soon as possible. Otherwise, it will recur, and the mistakes you are making will multiply, <coughs> and your condition will worsen. Realizing these types of things, we can take as, as perhaps a fact <coughs> that inside of us is the supreme fortune teller, that within us is this power that is constantly impelling us to the fulfillment of that destiny which is best for us, but which we have a tendency to reject. If, therefore, in earnestness and in great uh, need, we turn to an objective catalyst, this can be very important in the solution of a problem. An individual who wouldn't think of going to a maiden aunt for advice will go to a medium. He knows the, the aunt too well or doesn't agree with the aunt. Therefore, he goes to someone whom he assumes knows nothing about him. He goes to the fortune teller who lays out the cards. And in laying out the cards, we find the person hoping for an answer to, for a moment at least, suspend his own judgment in the hope that he is going to have a revelation uh, that is more useful. He would never stop uh, uh, alcoholism of his own accord. But if in a deck of cards it appears that if he keeps on drinking 
is going to become a hopeless alcoholic, he will listen to that because it seems to come from space. It seems to come from a superior source. And he does not realize that this superior source may be inside himself. So when the person relaxes away and says, I'm not going to judge this, I'm going to let the deck of cards tell me. In that very moment, he comes the closest to honest judgment of himself. He suspends and refrains for a little while from all the plots and plans that he had made about these circumstances. And becoming receptive to something laid out on the table in front of him, he is actually becoming receptive to that which is within him. And having a truer image, the mind will then read that imagery into the card. Of course, there are certain rules relating to card reading. Certain suits and certain cards have distinct uh, lettered meaning. But having a card in a suit with a general meaning, the psychic nature will reveal to him that which in his inner life is in rapport with that meaning. And he will read various things. But he is probably reading primarily from himself. Now, this might seem as though it represents a great deceit of some kind, but it really does not. Because actually, within each living being is the principle of the divine power itself. Therefore, locked within him is a divine wisdom that he doesn't understand. He doesn't know. He's been fighting to gain consciousness of it, but he is only very moderately successful. The power of life within himself is the power of deity in which rests the pre premonition of all things, the determination of the existence of every living thing rests in the divine. A spark of this divine is in each of us. And if we can get back to it as far as possible and listen to it, we will discover that it has all the answers that a life like ours requires at any given time, inasmuch as these answers are related to the degree of insight and understanding with which we can use them. So each person has his prophet locked within himself. He has within himself the wise principle, which is the wisdom of God in him. He cannot and get away from the pressure of the personality. He must have some kind of a device to assist him in this. Now these devices have always existed, but we haven't given them very much consideration we realize that the human mind has to outwit itself in some way before it can penetrate the surface of its own thinking. An Indian down in the Hopi Reservation uh, will take uh, two little pebbles. They're perfectly ordinary stones. Nothing remarkable about them. But if he puts these two stones together and ties them around with a certain number of threads of wool, of certain colors. They're not stones anymore. They're fetishes. They represent the capturing of some kind of a mysterious power in the two stones. They are no longer simply stones because he has performed a magic rite over them. And they become god powers or divine powers. Relics of all kinds come under this general heading. The individual, therefore, with the presence of this fetish, gains courage. He becomes more efficient. He may restore debilitated health. He may be successful in having a better harvest. All of these things are attributed to the fetish. But they are actually attributable to the release within himself of bondage to a lesser state of function. In other words, 
knowing his flock will increase, he tends it appropriately. Knowing that his health will improve, he follows the wisdom of the wet medicine priest and takes care of his health the best he can, following the ancient tribal laws. He becomes obedient to a conviction which he has created by magical means. Now, all kinds of things in nature, whether we realize it or not, have their magical overtones. There is nothing that we can look at, nothing we can touch, that does not have mystery in it. But we are not much concerned with mystery until we are confused. In India, the process of meditation lifts the mind from its commonplace, lifts it from its objectivity, frees it from all so-called external processes, and allows it to rest quietly in the substance of the soul. The soul then has the power to instruct the mind. The mind then interprets this instruction according to its own integrities and its own level of development. And the individual has a thought. He has an idea. He suddenly has a realization. He has a belief that he did not have before. And these various manifestations conditioned by the mind so that he can accept them become the basis of changes of all importance in his own life. One of the great changes in human life is repentance. The individual being sorry for what he has done and trying to make amends. The repentance originates in the soul. If in the uh, course of the time he picks a card from a deck, and he is quiet and wondering and hoping. The concept of repentance begins to move in him. And if the card is favorable, he will try to do what it recommends. If the card is unfavorable, he probably will wait and try again tomorrow, because he's determined that he must have the result. But if he is unfortunate, then perhaps he is also going to recognize the negative factor of himself, the guilt factor. The factor that he knows that he has definitely done that which is wrong. And the unfortunate card may prevent him from complicating or compounding the mistakes he has made already. The bad card becomes a warning against something. And in his own soul, he knows what that is. So there are so many different implications and ap applications to divination with cards that the only uh, practical way is to uh, read a, a good handbook on the subject, but always remember that the true decisions arise within yourself. Dependence upon psychic communication is fraught with many dangers especially when this communication is not solutional to the major values of life. Uh, many psychic revelations are so general uh, or so optimistic that they present no useful contribution. It is only when a proper rapport is established that the individual knows what he needs. We all know what we want, but only the wise know what they need. And in the interpretation of the cards or the crystal or any other form, the superficial part of ourselves wants an answer that will supply us with what we desire. But the deeper part of ourselves is always searching for that which is the greater good that which will assist us in developing and perfecting our own natures. So if you are given to card reading, if you are given to astrology, if you are given to any of these fields of mysticism, remember always that they are meditation centers by means of which it is hoped that you will explore the deep, deeper part of yourself 
and find out what your needs really are. A horoscope is a psychological pattern. It is not only something to tell you whether you'll be rich or poor. It is something to point out the chemistry of your own consciousness. And if you are able to relax into the knowledge of yourself, you will constantly receive constructive guidance. But if you relax only into the knowledge of your desires and the fulfillment of your ambitions and appetites, you will get into trouble. But even in cases of this kind, uh, the soul seems to operate more than we realize. The Mademoiselle Le Normand was the astrologer of Napoleon I. She was his guide for many years. And she was also a palmist and a card reader. She was probably the greatest psychic uh, consultant of her generation. She told Napoleon to stay out of Russia. That the evil card told her that if he went to Russia, all would be lost. But Napoleon thought at that time that he was more important and more powerful than a card. So he went to Russia, and that was the end. Now, the truth of the matter is that in the very depth of himself, in his own psychic nature, Napoleon realized not only the danger of the Russian campaign, because he was an expert militarist, but also he realized that the whole course of his life was essentially wrong. But he concealed this from himself. He concealed his fears from his own mind. He covered his doubts with his arrogance, and he covered his weaknesses with his ambitions. But when a person who was able to create a proper rapport with his unconscious, read the card. They knew perfectly well that he knew that he shouldn't go to Russia. But he didn't consciously know this. He refused to accept internal guidance. And he also, with Madame Lenormand, refused to accept the guidance of the seeress, who was really telling him the story of himself. So all the way along, if you are interested in the divin divination of any kind, be sure to center this divination thought upon trying to be quiet enough to let the best in you govern the rest. If you can do this, you may receive from the cards some clue and key as to how this best can best be used. But even this, will be at least in large measure a secondary substantiation of the primary reading. The reading is that each person must fulfill himself. And in the psychic world where barriers are not as strong as they are here, the flow of psychic energy is susceptible of, of diagnosis. And through the use of it, uh, you can help your life, but you can also help your life by one of the simplest of all of these meditational disciplines, and that is honest prayer, the dedication, devotion to principles, a re realization of right, and the courage to live according to the best you know. These also release the internal, and sometimes this release is a reflection from something outside of yourself but it's always aimed at that which is within you, by means of which, in the fullness of time, you will achieve the purpose for which the soul in you is guiding you. And until then, perhaps you need the dream, you may need the card, you may need the horoscope, but all of these can only help you to release that power in yourself which is always sufficient to all need if you use it properly. This is more or less the message of the moment as far as I see it.
So thank you very much. <laughs> this is open house. We hope you will all visit with us. We're going to have a little talk this afternoon on flowers. And for the occasion, we have placed a whole group of playing cards of different countries along the wall of the library uh, under the glass that's on the surface of the cases. So you will see European, Asiatic, Chinese, Persian. And in one book, I noticed that in one of the Persian decks of cards, the joker had the portrait of the Shah. Ah!